Morning and welcome to the Chargers Brawl Podcast. Jake Hefner, Mac, and Dan Wolkenstein here with you from the Brawl Network. It has been a tumultuous two weeks, to say the very least, with the outcry against uh, racial injustice and police brutality. And I know that um, everyone has spoken on this, and a, a lot of people would probably be able to speak on this better than myself. Uh, all I wanted to say before we get started on this morning, and of course, talking to, to Dan and Rem. Um, because it's been a while since we have gotten a chance to do do the podcast. And, and number one, it's great to be back. But all I can say is this, is that I know in terms of listening and learning to the issues that are going on in this country right now, I know that I can do better as a person. We as a group can do better as a community. We can do better. Businesses and sports can do better. And most of all, as a country, we have to do better to, to bring about change with what is going on. And if the, uh, if the eyes of the world and, and what is now seeing in terms of these protests now on a global scale, if nothing ends up changing from this, then I, I really don't know what will. So we have to really take advantage of, uh, of what is taking place in the world right now when it comes to this. But um, Dan, Rem, it is good to be back with both of you guys this morning. It's it's good to be talking about sports again. It's good to be talking about the Chargers again. How are you guys doing? Well, well said, Jake. Um, it's good to be back. You know, it's been a it's been a tough last few weeks, I think, for us and for everyone. Um, but you know, we have to keep it in perspective. It's been a tough um, decades for many uh, of the minorities. So you know, this is something that has been uh, kind of brought into the forefront of a lot of people's eyes. And you know, to your point, you know, I think we can all do better. And I hope that we all want to do better. Um, you know, it starts with us individually, you know, listening, empathizing, trying to improve everyone's quality of life. Um, so, you know, we're all in this together. Um, but now that we're able to talk to each other, it's good to hear you guys' voices. And, uh, you know, it's good to have something to lighten the mood a little bit. So I'm excited to talk to you guys. I love what we're going to be doing on this episode. Um, Can't wait to get after it. Uh, Ram, how you holding up, buddy? I'm good, guys. Man, like, to be honest, like, I just think the past couple of weeks have shown me, like, just how people kind of come together um, in response to all that's happening. So, you know, how you see it on social media, how you see it in person, downtown, uh, whether you're in Hollywood, like, wherever you are, like, it's all, everyone everyone's being heard right now. So it's just, it, it, it's, it's amazing to see what's coming out, but it's also, it's, it's, it's crazy to see the, the reality of it. Right. And it's just, and it's not just recently, it's always, it's been happening for a long time. So, you know, now that it's, now that it's here, like, you know, moving forward, like we all just need to like support each other, like even one person at a time, like just the person next to you, like your neighbor, um, like your workplace, like whatever you bring and value to like to your society or your community, like, you know, bring it now, like, and just, you know, bring, bring that change. And we're all capable of it. It starts with us. So, you know, I'm like, that, that's why it's, it's good to have this, what we have right now. Like, like I'm grateful over just, just this platform, be able to have our voices heard, like, you know, for Chargers fans to be heard. Like, it's just, it's, it's more than us. It's, it's, it's everyone. Right. So it's, it's just one day at a time. Right. So. Like, I'm here for you guys. Like, let's just support each other, and then we, we got this. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And again, it's uh, it's good to just get back in the swing of these things. And you know, this is the first time that we have done this podcast in the past two weeks. Um, so it's it's good to talk to Dan and Rem again, and uh, get back to talking Chargers, um, just with everything that's been going on outside of the last two weeks. Just the last several months in general, because the country's really been hurting and us as individuals have been hurting as well with our own uh, individual issues. But let's get into the show because we have 
we have a great show for for what we want to talk about today. And again, Dan Wolkenstein, who has, you know, very cleverly come up with the concepts of, of, of today's show and our last show that we did. Uh, he's got a very interesting idea that we're going to get into a little bit here. Uh, basically, if we were to take the all Madden team for the Chargers, and today we're just going to focus on the offense, but if you were to take the all Madden team of the Chargers on the offensive side of the ball, what would be your 11 players on offense that you would put together to create the all Madden team? So this was an idea from Dan that we're really excited to get into here in a little bit. But uh, I did want to touch base on, obviously, as things start to open up a little bit more now, the coaches are returning to training camp facilities. Players are going to be doing that here in the next couple of weeks. Inch by inch, we are getting closer to the beginning of the NFL season, which is great news for everybody. But um, I actually had a thought, and this was a poll that I put up this week uh talking about so going into the 2020 season the chargers have three offensive linemen that are going into contract years mike pouncey forrest lamp and dan feeney and my question was to chargers fans was given the fact of or given that these given these three players that are in contract years which did they expect to have a bounce back year in 2020 and the the person who came back with the most percentage didn't surprise me. It was Mike Pouncey. That was 57% of the votes. We had 172 votes on this in total. So Pouncey got 57% of this. What I was really looking for was who was going to come in second. And that was Forrest, and that was Forrest Lamp with 30%. And I wanted to bring this up to you guys because I, I, wanted, I wanted your call on this because I'm wondering for the fact that when you look at statistic-wise between Lamp and Feeney, they're not even close, really, just as far as game time experience. If you were to just take highlight, that's that. It's it's no contest. Um, so is this difference between Lamp at 30% and Feeney at 13%? Is it more from just a is it more from just a want to see a guy like Lamp mm-hmm. succeed when he had all of this? hype coming out of, of Western Kentucky when he was drafted, and we've just been waiting to see him become that staple at the left guard position? Or is it from the from the standpoint that just from from all set standpoint that we just think that, that Lamp would be better than Feeney? That's an interesting one. Uh, I th- Honestly, though, I think it is the name. I think when you look at Forrest Lamp, when the hype that he had going out coming out of college and in the pros, I mean, he was heralded as a second round steal should have been in the first round and we're set and he's been riddled by injury can't stay on the field um so you know not to the same extent but you think about kind of like a jason verrett where the dude has so much talent and just can't stay on the field and just shoots himself in the foot not to his fault but it just can't stay on the field and then you have dan feeney where like you know nothing sexy about it but you know he he hasn't played excellent But he's been pretty admirable with what he's had to deal with and what he hasn't had to his sides. And so I think if you were if you were to ask me, um, some might have said last year was Forrest Lamb's kind of make it or break it year. I've given I'm giving him this year. Um, If it's not this year, I think Dan Feeney's our guy. Um, But that's my take. I feel like people just know how good Forrest Lamb could be or was. And I think they're just hoping and praying to have that. That's probably where the recognition comes from. Yeah, I think uh, for me, I think Feeney's ex- ex- oh, what is it? Ex- exceeded my his expectations or my expectations. So I think he's performed better than uh, than he's been slated to. It's it's really a first time. We all waiting to see if he could just play a full season. So I mean, I think it's just a response to that. I think with Pouncey, uh, the health issue. I think he's going to bounce back. I think we expect him to be back. So it's really, it's really a force time. Everyone wants to see him. So I think the fans know, you know, that's kind of why. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Again, Pouncey didn't, didn't surprise me. Um, and, you know, Pouncey's going to be 31 years old next month. Uh, he only played five games last year before he went down with his neck injury. The year prior to that, he gave way to Melvin Gordon's best season that he had as a charger, as far as the, the rushing yards go. Um, but his, his reputation already speaks for itself. He's been in the league since 20, since 2011. He made his mark with all of his, uh, his time there in Miami. So he says he's fully healthy. 
he's he's ready to go. I, I think that he's you know with Scott Questenberry already on the roster. I think he's going to bring a lot, bring uh, some much needed money for an offensive line, especially when you're transitioning to Tyrod Taylor off of Philip Rivers. But when we're talking about the de- the debate between Forrest Lamb and Dan Feeney, again, because I still remember when both of these guys were drafted, because um, it went Forrest Lamp in the second round, Dan Feeney in the third, and both of them were the top two. Gu- one of the, I mean, two of the top guards in the class, no question. Forrest Lamp, as you said, Dan was was unheralded as a as a second round steal. Should have gone in the first round for the tape that he put on at Western Kentucky, but. God, when you look at this experience, Forrest Lamp has only played in nine career games over the last three seasons, as opposed to Dan Feeney's 47. And when you just look at that game experience, how much, how much, how far can talent take you alone before you're actually getting those in-game reps? So I think, like, for me, I would love to see Forrest Lamp become this guy. But I think that that is me speaking more from, from a heart standpoint what I knew from what Lamp did at Western Kentucky when he was in college and how dominating he was. Um, so it, it, it's, it, it's very tough. I mean, I, I think one of these guys is going to be gone, um, unfortunately, after this season. And the heart, the, heart is leading, the heart is leading with me right now before my head. And, I, and I'm, I think I'm just mentally pulling for Forrest Lamp at this point in his career just to get something going. So I would love to be able to see – both of these guys succeed, but Forrest Lamp is is definitely my uh, my underdog um, or comeback story, if you will, for this 2020 season. So moving on from that, uh, Dan, I'm going to let you intro this because, again, this is another one of your your great ideas that you've had for this show. But why don't you break it down as far as uh, either a how you came about with this idea and then kind of just explain what we're going to be doing when we talk about these guys. Sure. Um, so realistically, I think we all know and can appreciate that this is kind of a slow time when it comes to sports world. And so you, you're kind of going into your back pocket of all the things you could possibly do to uh, create content. And so, uh, you know, I've uh, I've gone through some Madden days of my own. Um, I still remember back with uh, Michael Vick on Madden, which was a cheat code, but uh, that's for another day. But anyway, it's got me thinking about, you know, if we had an all-Madden team, uh, who would it be for the Chargers? And this goes San Diego and L.A., obviously. Um, I think the three of us may have done it in different ways in terms of what our time frame was for these players. But the gist of it is, if you had your quarterback, your running back, you know, all the way down for offense and defense, today we're just going to do offense. Who is your all-time Chargers team uh, by position? Um, and go at it and see how those teams stack up. So I think all three of us have our guys, and we'll go through, talk about the ones that are similar, and then go through the ones that are different. Um, but I think this is going to be a fun one to kind of go back down memory lane. And there might be some surprising tidbits uh, that we all, uh, or you, have uh, really not realized. So with that, um, Jake, how do you want to do this? Do you want to do your first position, and then we'll all go around the room? Let's start with the quarterback position because I feel like that's a position that universally all three of us are going to have similar. Um, so let's go ahead and just kick it off. Signal caller, no question about it. When you think of you know the top two quarterbacks in Chargers history, you immediately think of Philip Rivers or Dan Fouts. But Philip Rivers wins this out for me by a landslide. He holds virtually every passing record for the Chargers. Um, selected to eight Pro Bowls during his career. His records that he holds are for uh, yards, completion, attempts, and touchdowns. Um, is currently the NFL's Iron Man for the most consecutive games played. Uh, there's we've talked about Philip Rivers and nauseam on this show. So when you just talk about statistics alone for his longevity, for the way that he played, for the way that he's carried himself, there's no question that Philip Rivers is my quarterback all time for Chargers. Yeah, for me, of course. Philip Rivers. Um, I think m- one of my favorite seasons has to be early on in his career. Maybe his first first season you know he didn't even uh what is it the first game against the Raiders he only threw for 11 t- he had only 11 attempts but he, we won the game I think it was like 27-0 um but that was just like a I know like LT had the shine um that was like his magical MVP season but Philip Rivers like that was one of his best seasons and he was just very efficient um and just it was just amazing to see that see him be that successful going leading the team to 14-2 and two, 
you know, getting winning the division, best record in the NFL, and then just you know, getting the divisional round, like for his first for his first uh you know year as a starter. I mean, that just kind of set the tone for the rest of his career. You know, of uh, leading up to last season. So, you know, his, I think as of late, his best season was in 2018, um, when we went 12 and four. You know, met the Patriots again in the divisional round. So, I mean, there's a lot of Rivers moments for me, um, but it's just amazing to see at least he you know he's played at a high level from the get-go and then you know i know it's not a philip river season in 2019 but it's it's better than a lot of other quarterbacks so you know that that speaks for itself the body of work speaks for itself just look, look up the stats man like just he's he done a lot for the charters yeah and uh funny i was not thinking philip rivers actually i was gonna go with doug flutie um if you think wow. about flutie, i mean you have a quarterback who can kick who can throw, who can run. Uh, No, I'm just kidding. Uh, (laughs) uh, (laughs) If we were were to go through, and again, so I think this is where uh, time frame goes into play. So I had uh, just kind of in my uh, fanhood. So the two that I was going, that I was thinking were Rivers and Breeze. And yes, to your point, Jake, obviously Rivers is um, the number one guy. And, you know, there's many reasons why he's just the the teammate he is, just the person, the character. Um, I mean, like you mentioned, he holds literally almost every single franchise record at the position. Um, some of them might be negative, but that's just because he's been doing it for so long. But, I mean, the guy went to eight Pro Bowls, most games, wins, yards, touchdowns, passer rating, all of those records for the franchise. Uh, you, you just – it's pretty cut and dry there. Um and when I was thinking, and just a quick th- thought, when I was thinking about Drew Brees, because, you know, revisionist history, you think, oh, Drew Brees was so good. Um, but going back and just kind of looking at the stats, you know, after the fact, it was a bit surprising to me. Um, Drew Brees, if you go back and look at it, he was more or less above average as a quarterback in San Diego. And he did not become the Drew Brees we know until he went to New Orleans. Um, I mean, I think he had... 80 touchdowns and 53 interceptions um, when he was in San Diego, which, like, that's not good. That's like a 1.5 touchdown interception ratio. Fast forward to his career in New Orleans, he's got like a 2.5 touchdown interception ratio with over 450 touchdowns and like 180 interceptions. And so Drew Brees now is elite. And will be in the Hall of Fame. But as a Charger, he wasn't as good as, honestly, that I thought he was going back. And I think it just kind of, you kind of blur the lines with where your players were. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Philip Rivers, head and shoulders, clearly number one quarterback. Definitely. Definitely. We'll pick the position that you guys want to go next because we'll have some fun with this. If we want to go running back, this should also be pretty quick, too. So, uh, what do you guys want to do as far as next position goes? Yeah, let's go running back for sure. Uh, all right, Rem. Gonna... Kick... Go, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Kick us off, Rem. Yeah. You know who we're mentioning it. Uh, you know, LeDain Tomlinson, one of the best running backs of all time. Uh, 2006 MVP season, 31 touchdowns, record breaker. Uh, just the consistency he's had, like up to, was it 2010, 2009? Uh, just the level of production he's had, uh, just on and off the field, just the true leader. Just to see him produce at a high level, like from the get go, too. Like, not just Rivers, like, just to have LT do that. Um, you know, he's one of the fan favorites of uh, most Chargers fans. It's either him or Seau, if you think about it, um, or Rivers, but those are the big three. Um, yeah, man. If, like I said, I know we mentioned this on a previous podcast. If you just listen to his Hall of Fame speech uh, from 2017, uh, it really bring you back. Um, but yeah, I mean, Ludane Tongue and LT, 21. Yeah, uh, so the the depth chart I have for my all Madden team for running back, I have LT, I have Sproles, and uh, the surprise number three I have is Melvin Gordon, uh, which I know oh, that might be, might be controversial right now. I know, um, but I'll get into that. So, I mean, LT, you know, you you don't, you know, you hear about, you know, he's in the Hall of Fame here. He's the greatest running back for the Chargers, but you go back and you look at like his career stats and the records he holds and boy, like the list goes on and on and on and on. And for someone who never made it to the Super Bowl, for someone who was always striving to get that ring, the amount of accolades that this guy got 
are staggering. I mean, I think he had some of this was like mind blowing to me. Like you think about this in today's NFL, like it just doesn't happen. Um, nine seasons of 10 plus rushing touchdowns consecutively. Right. He had five of 14 plus touchdowns. He was the fastest to gain 15,000 yards. And he had eight consecutive seasons with 1,500 plus scrimmage yards. Mm-hmm. A running back today doesn't get half that in terms of number of years consecutively. There just aren't running backs made like LaDamian Tomlinson. And there probably won't be. Um, the guy was just a stud. And so you lose sight of how great of a player you're watching at the time. But looking back, you, there's never going to be anybody like him. Um, so second and third on my depth chart, I'll go quick on these. Darren Sproles, you know, he wasn't the guy that racked up all the yards as a running back. But he was just someone who electrified this team, the stadium, the crowd. He always was someone who can take it to the house. He had four kickoff or punt return touchdowns as a charger, six and a half yards per touch. Uh, I'll always remember his uh, walk-off touchdown against the Colts in the playoffs. Um, he was just fun, fun to watch. And then Melvin Gordon, you know, he gets a lot of flack. I know uh, there's a little bit of sour grapes right now with him on the Broncos, but uh, if you just think about him just as a player, as a Chargers running back, um, at least in my generation, uh, I can't think of another running back better than him. You know, maybe Michael Turner, but I don't think so. Um, you know, Ryan Matthews, I guess, sort of. But I, th- I still think Melvin Gordon is better than both of them. So, I mean, the dude still had 47 touchdowns for us, 6,000 plus scrimmage yards. Um, he did have a few fumbles, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, top three depth chart, LT Sproles, Melvin Gordon. So, mine's very similar two years down. I only went with two running backs on my chart. I went LT and Sproles. And I thought about this for a little bit, uh, just as far as thinking about whether or not I was going to put two or three in. And I went with two just because of the fact that, you know, the game was so much different when you, because the, the discrepancy, if you're looking, if you're just taking the, the all time franchise leader in, in running backs, obviously LT is number one you got to go all the way back to the inception of the Chargers back in the 60s, and it's Paul Lowe, who, if we're looking for the difference between LT's yards and Paul and Paul Lowe's yards, Paul Lowe had 4,972 rushing yards. That's the discrepancy between number one and number two, which is just absolutely ridiculous. And that was at a time when the NFL was much more of a running game type of a league. So it's just insane, the discrepancy there. But you already touched on so many of LT's stats. You know, the biggest one that always comes to mind is that still today, he holds a record that I don't believe is going to be broken by any other running back. And that is that he is the NFL single season, holds the NFL single season record for rushing touchdowns in a single season. And that's with 31. I can't see any other running back in this era with the way that the running game has changed to a two back or a running back by committee type of scenario that you're going to see that type of production from one running back any longer. I just don't see it. And then the other step that I actually forgot for as, as, as multidimensional of a running back that LT was, is that not just from the rushing standpoint, uh, we knew that he could throw the touchdown. He has a great passer rating, by the way, for his career. I think it's like 146 <laughs> it is in passer rating. But he had 540 career receptions in his first. Oh, no, I take that back. Sorry. His second year in the league, 100 of those came in 2003 of his 540 which is just ridiculous to see from a running back. It's absolutely nuts. So we could go on and on and on and talk about the accolades of LT. Um, Darren Sproles was my number, was my number two on my chart Uh, as a third down back as a special teams weapon. You got to love the story from this kid coming up as a fifth round pick, Um, you know, 345 carries for 2,554 yards, 17 touchdowns. He had four touchdowns on special teams uh, his claim to fame to me was what he did in that playoff game at Qualcomm against Indianapolis when LT was not not able to play. And he just became a one-man wrecking crew. It didn't matter. He, he, that dude was playing offense, special teams, punt returns, kickoffs, and he did it all. And an, an overtime win just showed and proved that it didn't matter for the fact that he was 5, what was he, 5'8", that he could just dominate a team. 
and it was it was such a rewarding moment for a guy who probably was considered an underdog through most of his college career to see what he was able to produce, not just with the Chargers, but what he ended up producing for the Saints. It was just unreal. So um, it, it was really it, it was tough because to choose between these guys when you because I did think about Michael Turner for a little bit, but when you think about guys that have really changed the game specifically for the Chargers, I had to go with those. So let's, well, let me, let's let me, jump into. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, can I yeah, bring yeah. up some? Let me bring up some Sproles numbers real quick. Just so sure. it just stands out to me, man. Because during these all-time uh, guys, like it's just crazy, like to see the numbers. So you know, we drafted him in 2005. Played with us. Uh, what is it? Us, the Saints, and the Eagles. But well, look at this, man. Was it 2007, 2008? 11.8 yards per reception. In 2008, 11 yards per reception in 2009. So he has 32 receiving touchdowns. And look how many first downs he's had in his whole career. 223 first downs. Like, just, that's it. Like, and then look at all the long plays he's had. Like, up 81, 66, 57, like, these seasons. So, I mean, he's just a big play. Like, just to, just to see him, you know, it's just crazy. Like, a lot of the Chargers players just, they, they have find some success early on, and then they flourish like outside of like outside if they get to another team. Like Sproles is a good example, but just the level of consistency he's had, um, and then you still see highlights even up to like the past couple seasons, right? So I mean that's why like I know Sproles is a fan favorite, and you can't really keep them all. Um, but yeah, man, I'll always remember him. Um, just he's always had moments, and he always just knows how to move around the field, just using the blockers. Like he knows how to use the offensive line and he just made it difficult for defenders to like, you know, to tackle him because it just has changed his direction. You can't see him, you know, just his, his own vision, his footwork. So, you know, like I think the guys coming up into the next season can really learn a lot from Sproles because they have like a similar, like similar, uh, phys- you know, physical feature. They're smaller than like, we don't have a Melvin Gordon, right? So Joshua Kelly is a little bit uh, un- undersized, but he's a bigger. So, you know, there's a lot that these guys can- the Chargers running backs can learn from, uh, you know, Sproles and LT. Mm-hmm. The next position I want to talk about, because I think that this will be one that is universally agreed upon between the three of us, and that's tight end position. Um, so I went with a two tight end set. I mean, it's, it's hard to think about another team that's got two tight ends in their history that have revolutionized the game in their respective eras. So I'll start, obviously, with Kellen Winslow. Well, real, real quick, that, real quick before you go that, there, you could you could say that um, Rob Gronkowski and Aaron Hernandez rev- revolutionized it for different reasons, but I digress. True, true. So, <laughs> <laughs> and they were playing on the same team and together, so that's just that's a cheat code within itself when they were both at their prime. Um, but thank you for that tidbit of information, on, Dan. On I really appreciate field. it. On and off the field. On the spot. Oh, oh, okay. Well. That's a conversation for a different day. <laughs> but on the spot with Dan Wolkenstein coming to you next week. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Kellen Winslow, for the tight end position at that point in time, revolution tight end position, was a former first-round pick, went to five Pro Bowls in his nine years that he was in the league, was elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 95. Obviously, you want to go back to some of his memories outside of what he did was the one of the most famous games in playoff uh, history was the win against Miami in 1982 when Winslow had 13 receptions for 166 yards, one touchdown. He also ended up blocking a crucial kick that ended up leading the Chargers to uh, to an overtime win against Miami. Um, this guy was just a, it was a different breed of a tight end when he came in the league. Um, you know, for the size that he was and the way that he can move, people said that he moved like a wide receiver, but he played this position. It was basically like having an extra wide receiver out there. Um, so that was that to me, you know, the tight end position had been changed over time before Winslow got there. But that was he was the guy in the catalyst who changed it again uh, in the 80s with the Chargers. And then, of course, you know, how could you not put Antonio Gates at the top of your list, a franchise leader in receptions? Uh, holds the NFL record for most tight ends in their career by a tight end. Um, and just a great story. An undrafted free agent out of Kent State and made eight consecutive Pro Bowls. That's just ridiculous. Was was arguably the best handcuff for either Drew Brees or Phillip Rivers during during his prime. Um, 
and what he's been able to do from his career from being a guy who was looking at a possible basketball career is just insane. So there, there's no question that both of these guys are tight end one and two in history. Yeah, I would say uh, I didn't go that far back for Count Winslow, so I just left it with Antonio Gates. Um, hands down, by far, uh, the best in, ter- in my eyes. I think he, even if you just put him and Count Winslow together, I think I would probably still take Antonio Gates. Um, I mean, he was just such a good all-around tight end. And for someone who wasn't even playing football prior to – I mean, he was a basketball player, and he used that, those skills to become a tight end in the NFL – I mean, the guy had almost 12,000 yards. I mean, he had like 116 touchdowns. Uh, he was so good at blocking. He was such a great teammate. He was a safety valve to literally every quarterback. Um, and he just, I mean, his, the security that he gave quarterbacks, I mean, he, he had hands that were like glue. And he caught everything. Um, I don't know how many first downs that he had as a tight end, but I would bet you that it's close to the top, if not the most for any tight end. You know, maybe Tony Gonzalez has more, but still, I mean, it was the guy was ridiculous. And, you know, it is, it is kind of sad that you saw how the careers kind of ended where it was kind of anticlimactic for, you know, him and Bree or him and Rivers and LT together. But, man, Antonio Gates is so dang good. Um, yeah, he has to be on that All-Madden team. All right, so some kind of kind of cool fun stats. Um, like I think a few seasons ago, uh, there's this app called FireFan. Um, it's like an in-game like it's an in-game like app with football. Like it's actually it, so it actually occurs during the game. So you kind of respond to like while the game's on. So a good example would be like Sunday Night Football. So like as the game is going on, you kind of predict like what happens. Like is he going to get a first down or not? So uh, that season, like Kellen Winslow. Uh, was actually like a he would host like a fire fan league like during the game so I used to play with them like every week for like for that season so it was kind of cool just like uh, just interacting with him um, he's a really good guy he's like stand up stand up guy on and off the field um, but so yeah, just a fun uh, drop in but um, what I'm looking at the comparisons like dude the career average yards of reception uh, for Kellen Winslow is 12.5 Antonio Gates is 12.4 uh, Kellen Winslow had three seasons of, of receiving for receiving yards of more than a thousand, and then Antonio Gates had uh, two seasons. So I mean, just I I wasn't alive yet for Kellen Winslow's best seasons, which was from 1980 to 1983. Um, so you know, just, his career wasn't as long as Gates, but I, I'm I'm just glad that I was get was able to see all of Gates's uh, career. I was there for the uh, his record breaker against the Dolphins. Um, so that was nice. Um, oh, there's a lot of good Gates moments. Um, I met him like was it at North County Fair? So just you know, you know his level of production. Uh, his best season was it 2009 for 1157 yards. Uh, I I think it was just was it the 2007 season? He he was banged out for the playoffs, so he didn't. I know Chargers fans are going to forget. He didn't. He wasn't able to make the run, so he didn't really play in the AFC Championship. So, uh, but you know, other than that, man, like just both both those players, we we have one of the best tight ends. We have two of the best tight ends in history. So, I mean, I'm just grateful. So <laughs> these next two positions. <laughs> so these next two positions. Um, these I feel are going to be a little bit all over the place. I think we're going to have different uh, opinions on this. Um, so we got the offensive line and the wide receivers remaining. I want to start with the offensive line and you tell me how you guys want to do this. If you guys want to break it down right to left, each going by the right, the right tackle, right guard, center, left guard, left tackle. Or if you want to talk about it as just a whole to go through our own starting five that we would have for the all Madden team. What do you guys think? We can, we can go through like, uh, just name our five and then. Then we'll break them down and then see if we're all like on the same page or, and then we'll just, okay. Them yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'll start, I'll start and I'll try and go through this as, as quickly as possible. So I'm going to go right to left on this from mine. So again, when you look at the Chargers offensive line, when we've seen enough changes in the Chargers offensive line happen in the last decade, it's really hard to have recency bias for 
picking offensive linemen for the Chargers to put on an all Madden team. So I really had to mix around my decisions. And of course, some of these guys I've never seen play during my lifetime. But when you look at what they did for the team, if you were to tell me, oh, yeah, like I'm putting this guy on my all Madden team. When you look at uh, their longevity, their consistency, their stats, it's fantastic. And it's no question when you look at right tackle, when we've seen what we've gotten in recent years with Sam Tevy, Jeremy Clary over the years. How about you go all the way back to the 1960s with Ron Mix, a nine time all star is in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, was heralded as one of the greatest offensive linemen for his time. Funny story that he was actually drafted by the Baltimore Colts, but the Chargers came at him with a more lucrative offer. So instead of playing for the NFL, he jumped over to the AFL during that time. And a little fun fact about Ron Mix, in his 10 years of playing, he had two holding penalties. Wow. Two in 10 years. I want that as my right tackle, no question about it. So moving on from him, uh, let's go to the right guard position. Again, another position for the Chargers that's seen a turnstile of people go through it. But another uh, decade-long player starting in the 60s, Walt Sweeney, played in 154 consecutive games. Six-time All-Star, selected to the Pro Bowl three times. Um was there for a little bit of, of the Dan Fouts, Air Coriel area during the, the tail end of his career, but was a staple for the Chargers in, in, in that decade that he was there. Now you're going to get some recency bias from me, and, and I think that a lot of people would agree. I think the three of us agree with who's the center that you think of when it's the Chargers for the all-time team. And I honestly had a toss-up here between two guys. And again, because I was looking at different generations, I could be – I could do the recency bias thing and take Nick Hardwick from 2004 to 2014. Or I could have gone back to the 70s from Don Masick, who played in 76 through 89, who was also in the Chargers Hall of Fame. But strangely enough, Don Masick never made a Pro Bowl. He was, he was skipped over for the Pro Bowl for all of his accolades that he has. So because of that, and because of a little bit of recency bias, and because without Nick Hardwick, I don't believe that Philip Rivers nor LT would have had the careers that they had. Nick Hardwick is my winner for this position, no question about it. 136 uh, consecutive games that he played was just the field general. Again, like I said, it's uh, Philip Rivers doesn't have the career that he had if it's not for Nick Hardwick. Um, when Nick Hardwick went down, the offensive line play started to, to drastically crumble. So his effect definitely went beyond his position when he was not playing. Um, and it's taken us a while to get back to having that type of experience to a guy who can call out proper protections um, and just solidify center position. So no question about it. It's Nick Hardwick all time for me for, for a Chargers all Madden team. Left guard, Chris Dealman. 2003 to 2011, great story from him. Undrafted free agent from Indiana. He converted to an offensive guard from playing on the defensive side of the ball. Made four consecutive Pro Bowls between 2007 and 2010. Um, was, was, was basically, again, another fixture for, for LT during his prime rushing years. Um, protected for Phillip Rivers for, I think it was five years once Phillip Rivers got started. So before he ended up having, you know, his unfortunate health problems, he was a staple for the Chargers offensive line for a long time. And then when we get to the left tackle position, I know that you guys, and I, I'm sure that most people, and I, I had to toss around on this as, as well, that Marcus McNeil would come to, come to mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if Marcus McNeil... If Marcus McNeil's career was not cut short by injuries, it's crazy to think that Marcus McNeil only played five years in this season uh, or in his career, excuse me. Um, but he was a second round pick out of Auburn in the first two years that he was in the league. He made the Pro Bowl in the first two. And he was he became the blindside protector the first year that Philip Rivers was the starter and the year that LT set the all time rushing touchdown title uh, record. So for a rookie coming in to protect the blind side of a, a quarterback and lead the way for a running back to have the best of his career is just nuts for that type of production. And it's a shame to think of his career getting cut short, what could have been 
had he played another five on top of that. So I couldn't do it just from the standpoint of he only played for that short. So what would I do? I would reach back to this during the Don Coriel, um, Dan Fouts era, Billy Shields, 1975, three round kick. Never missed a game during his final nine seasons. Blocked, uh, you know, blocked the blind side for Dan Fouts during his his pivotal years that ultimately ended up taking them to great playoff runs during his career. Um, and again, just from that standpoint of and longevity of their careers and what they did with a bigger body of work, it's the only reason why I take Billy Shields ahead of Marcus McNeil on, on this list. So that's my starting five, my all Madden's Chargers uh, offensive line. Okay, I'll go next. Um, I'll go left to right then. I got Marcus McNeil. <clears throat> I got Chris Dillman, Nick Hardwick. And I'm just going to keep it recent. And just because, like, no one really stands out to me. So I'm just going to, since they're on the roster now, I'm going to take Trey Turner and Brian Bulaga. So you say what you ever want to say. <laughs> but I'm just going to look at the body of work. Um, yeah. You know, uh, they're on the Chargers now for 2020. And, you know, we expect great things. Five Pro Bowl seasons with Trey Turner. Um, you know, he's worked with the former Chargers offensive quarter, I mean, head coach to Norv Turner. So, you know, he knows what the Chargers are going to be about. Um, I think he's going to produce. I think he's going to produce for this running back core, Eckler, Jackson, Joshua Kelly. Same with Bulaga. He, him and James Campin, I just, just the protection that he gave for Rodgers, I think he's going to do that for, you know, for Herbert or Tyrod. Um, so just for those, for that side, for McNeil, just that season alone, like he's always going to be remembered for Chargers fans, and like I haven't seen a, a left tackle that's really like protected like that, and then just in run support, um, he's just a mauler, right? Seven, what is it? Six, seven foot, six, six, seven, uh, three hundred fifty pounds, I believe, from Auburn. Man, he was huge. Just look at his hands too. Just the comparison. He he made sure he took away. He took away any threats to Rivers' blind side. Um, yeah, it, just, it sucks that his career didn't go as long as it lasts, but, you know, as long as he had those few seasons, like, that's good enough for me. Um, Chris Dillman, he's one of those just, like, those blue-collar, uh, tough nose. Like, he's just – he was one of the nastiest, like, offensive line we've ever had. Uh, and then Nick Hardwick, just, just his consistency, his leadership, uh, his knowledge, and then, you know, just the level of play that he brought to this team. You know, he's a fan favorite, you know. Uh, I mean, just for the record, I, I enjoyed all his all his radio shows with uh, on 1360 back then. So, you know, he's he's a great guy. Just just that's my that's my offensive line on that in Chargers team. Remy Mack hitching his wagon to the future of Trey Turner and Brian <laughs> Bulaga. We'll see where that goes. Dan, yeah. go for it. Yeah, I was going to say, honestly, um, I, I don't think there's any new names here that you guys haven't already talked about. So I can go pretty quickly. Um, Marcus McNeil, tackle. Uh, it's kind of interesting. You go back, you know who he, his, um, his measurements are eerily similar to, uh, someone who all of us were super high on in the draft this year, uh, the eclipse of Mackay Becton. Oh, geez. Uh, yes. Six, seven, three fifty for McNeil, three, six, seven, three sixty for Becton. I mean, these guys were massive. Um, Marcus McNeil. I mean, he was great. I, I loved watching him play. I mean, two time pro bowler. He only had three holding penalties his entire career. God. Uh, wow. For somebody that big, I mean, it kind of makes sense because when you're that big, you don't really have to hold because you're kind of already there. <laughs> but Mark McNeil loved him. Um, I'm going to go with, I'm actually going to go with Rem on this. Uh, Brian Bulaga. <laughs> and the reason, and the reason, wow. the reason for that, um, tell me a better tackle than Brian Bulaga <laughs> that was on the Chargers. You can't. You can't. So I'm going to put it there. Uh, then for guard, I have Chris Dealman. It was so fun to watch him and Nick Hardwick, who is my center. Um, them two together were so nasty. And it was so fun to watch. Uh, Dealman, two-time All-Pro, four Pro Bowls. I mean, a two-time All-Pro for the Chargers. That says enough. Um, same for my other guard, Trey Turner. Uh, again, find me another guard better than Trey Turner on the Chargers. You just won't. Um, so that's my guard. And well, then Sweeney, Nick, I just said it. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Go ahead. True, true, true. But I'm I'm talking. Remember, my lens was kind of like since I've been a fan. So yes, I don't I, 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 go back that far. Uh, so yeah, so Trey Turner. Um, hopefully, he continues that. But just if you just take his accolades, five-time Pro Bowler. We don't have that as a guard in the recent era. Uh, and then yeah, Nick Hardwick. He was so fun to watch. He was like one of the steadiest anchors we had. Uh, on this offensive line, he kind of set the tone so often, and he was so savvy as a center, so cerebral. He was very smart. Um, and, you know, to your point, Jake, there weren't many bright spots in the Chargers offensive line over the last, call it, two decades or so. Mm-hmm. But if you look at Marcus McNeil, Nick Hardwick, Chris Dealman, those are probably the three. I mean, you can, I even looked at like Russell Okung potentially. But like he, he he's been good. But he he was clearly better in Seattle uh, than he was with us, and so I c- I couldn't put him on there. There weren't many great offensive linemen on this team. Uh, it's been a turnstile for way too long. We've been at the bottom of the NFL in terms of offensive line rankings for more than I want to admit. So this is probably the weakest of the position groups of offense and defense for the Chargers team. So on the flip side of that, you go to our final position that we're about to talk about with the wide receivers. There's been a don't you for, don't you forget about those fullbacks? Oh well, yeah. How could I forget about fullbacks? Go ahead, go ahead, Dan. Since you since okay. you since you called it out, go ahead. I'm, I'm sure right. I know where you're going to go with this one. Yes, Bobby Holly, the Hall of hey. Fame, the Hall of Fame <laughs> fullback for the Los Angeles Chargers. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> although I will say um, he does have, although there are big shoes to follow, um, it says a lot that he's already wearing 41, uh, which is clearly Chargers' best fullback, Lorenzo Neal. Uh, yeah. Watch the mauler that he was. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I felt bad for all of the defenders that had to go up against him because he was looking to lay the wood every single time and the guy had no neck and he would just demolish people and when you look at the success of Ladanian Tomlinson and you ask Ladanian Tomlinson he'll tell you how important and how vital Lorenzo Neal was to his success um he wasn't as uh multifaceted as someone like a Derek Watt was um but for what he was designed to do which was block for uh Ladanian Tomlinson the dude was incredible. So uh, Lorenzo Neal, Hall of Fame, fullback, Chargers, book it. And then, of course, Bobby Holly, he'll be in the Hall of Fame too. So number. <laughs> Go ahead, Rem. Honorable mention, Jacob Hester. Um, I don't know hey, why. LSU <laughs> alum. Not, not bad. I like Jacob. My favorite. I like him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just, just watching him play uh, on off the field. He's a fan favorite. But yeah, Lorenzo Neal, he's he's a Hall of Fame inductee this coming season, so it's going to be. I don't know who's he who's gonna, who he's going to go in as. Hopefully, he goes in as a Charger or a Titan. Um, I'm not too sure. Um, I don't know what other team he'd choose, but hopefully, he goes in as a Charger. Um, and then who else? Other fullback. Oh, uh, honorable mention Mike Tolbert too. Uh, he Tolbert. Was I love the belly roll. Yeah. Belly roll was yeah. great. <laughs> he his end zone celebrations. He had the best uh, end zone celebrations. Not only just for the full backs, all the running backs. Because you know, LT did his little teardrop. Sproles kind of just he's a little, you know, just a little the lightning bug. Um, but yeah, Tolbert had the best celebrations by far. You know what's ridiculous is that I think a lot of people forget about Lorenzo Neal. Do you know? Do you remember how old Lorenzo Neal was when he came to the Chargers? Um, the only reason why I know it is because I actually had pro football reference open, so I'll leave it to you. <laughs> he was 33 years old when he came to the Chargers and started blocking. Which is I got that right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's nuts for, for a guy who had already, I think he was on, what, two or three teams before he ended up coming onto the Chargers. I can't remember off the top of my head of who he was drafted by. But, yeah, it does help when you have one of the greatest runs in history that you block for, but still what Lorenzo Neal did. And, and some of my favorite moments was not necessarily when he'd be blocking for LT, but when Lorenzo would get the ball, <laughs> yeah. no defensive back 
no defensive back wanted any part of Lorenzo Neal when he started going down the field. And instead of, instead of people coming at him, they would more be backpedaling, just trying to corral him to go out of bounds. Nobody wanted a piece of Lorenzo Neal when he came barreling down the field. And, uh, and you know, just aside from that, just to, to see what he did, and th- those were probably his best years that he had with the Chargers for his career, blocking for LT and even the production that he was able to give um, from a, a receiving fullback standpoint. Much like you had said, Dan, he was used in a similar type of way that that we were using Derek Watt to try to get some of those little receiving yards for. But Lorenzo did it obviously a, a lot better than um, than Watt did. But at the same token, it's just you know, he, he's, he's on that, he's on that short list for a position that has been slowly been phasing out of existence. He is on that short, short list of, of the best fullbacks of all time. No question about it. Yeah. And um, your point, Jake, so, that it was, it was pretty, I went back and looked because that age that he came on this team was insane that he played that well for what, five seasons on the chargers, but he played for the, <laughs> the saints, the jets, Mm-hmm. Played for the the Bucks. He played for the Titans. He played for the Bengals, and then us. <laughs> well, so he was a five teams before he got to us. Yep. And then he went to Baltimore after us. Um, mm-hmm. He played more seasons with us than any other team. I I'd be shocked if he didn't pick the Chargers as the team that he goes uh, in the Hall of Fame with, just because I think he that's when he shined the most. Um, yes. But yeah, I I. I don't think I realized that he played that long for that many teams before. Mm-hmm. He That's crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? See, I, I didn't realize that either because I knew Lorenzo Neal as he was the Titans fullback and then he was ours. Yeah. I didn't, yeah. I didn't pay too much attention to his career before then. I get, I, you wouldn't think it for a guy who's 33 years old playing the way he did. He lo- looked like he was playing younger than that. So it was just insane what he was able to do. So he had, eight, eight, he had 18 touchdowns in his career. <laughs> it's great. So moving on to our final position here at the wide receivers, I'm sure that myself and the guys took different perspectives. And this is a position that it's basically take your pick. What generation do you want to pull from? What receiver do you want to talk about? So I kept it to three wide receivers on mine. That's what I kept myself off at. Um, if not, we could be we could be here all day talking about Chargers receivers that we we have a uh, soft spot for. Um, so if you want, I could do it in similar fashion to the way that I did the offensive line. I'll talk about my three. So again, I went generationally, picked one out of each generation that I thought was was the best. So going back to the early '60s, Bambi. Lance Allworth, 1962 to 1970, 9,584 receiving yards, 81 touchdowns. The reason that he's on this list is that Lance Allworth was doing this before the game really became a vertical passing league. This is before the aerial days. Um, this was before the Dan Fouts days. This is back when a quarterback named John Hale was throwing to Lance Allworth. And to put up this type of production at that point in time when the game was all about the running game is just nuts. So there's no way that you can leave, um, that you can leave him off of, of the all-time greats. 81, Next for me, 81 touchdowns. 80, 81 touchdowns. In a, in, a, in a time when the, the rushing game was dominant. It's just absolutely nuts. Um, so my second wide receiver, Charlie Joyner. This was difficult to pick because now when you're getting into the Air Coriel area, down Fouts is the quarterback, you're talking about Charlie Joyner, who's on the same offense as Kellen Winslow, Wes Chandler, and a multitude of other guys during during this time frame. But Charlie Joyner was was my pick just because of his, his consistency in production. 10 years was a, was a key cog of the Air Coriel offense. Five, or no, excuse me, seven times, um, seven seasons, he had 50 receptions or more, made the Hall of Fame in 96, finished with 12,146 yards and 65 touchdowns. Absolutely ridiculous for a guy to have that type of production through a 10-year 10 10 year span. It's awesome. And again, for... 
for a, a wide receiver that was just uh, surrounded by talent for, for offensive weapons on that. He's the one that stuck out the most to me, no question about it. Now I come more modern era. It's KA13. It's Keenan Allen because there is a good chance that if the production that Keenan Allen has shown since being with this team since 2013, if he can continue this for another five, six seasons, he could break some of these records by some of these guys. So just to let you know where he's currently at, uh, he's at 6,405 yards with 34 touchdowns. In his first two seasons, Allen recorded 148 receptions for nearly 2,000 yards and 12 touchdowns. It's interesting how his first two seasons mirrored his his last two seasons that we've seen over the last two years because his last two years, he's just gone off on a tear. He, he's, uh, he's recorded 2,600 yards off of 199 receptions and 12 touchdowns and has solidified himself as one of the top uh, wide receivers in this league. So... I, ha- I had to go modern with Keenan Allen, just a, a guy who, uh, as far as his consistency, his production, he'd probably be a lot. There's a good chance he could have already been past Lance Allworth if injuries had not derailed some of uh, of his career thus far. It- it's really astonishing to see a guy who is not all speed. It is more from just a technique standpoint, separate himself uh, when it just comes to a a generated learned skill set for a wide receiver to be, to do what he's done and uh, to become one of the top wide receivers in the league is, is nothing but incredible and a testament to his work ethic. So Lance Allworth, Charlie Joyner and Keenan Allen are my three. The thing. So uh, again, so looking at mine, um, man, I'm still still mind blown by the 81 touchdowns with Bambi. That's crazy. Um, Mm -hmm. So I went, uh, a little bit different. So again, I'm thinking of my era. And when you talk about a receiver that is just clutch, that does not drop anything, that will I know where you're going with this. Streak down the field, streak down, catch the ADR touchdown. Travis Benjamin. <laughs> five, oh, was the worst receiver that I have seen on this team. Um <laughs> You can make an honorable mention for Buster Davis, but it's, I mean, Travis Benjamin, award winner. Um, well, Wofford. he caught all three, all, he caught all three balls that were thrown to him this last season, yes? Yes, I think he did. Okay. He so, he did. 100% his, his, catch percentage, Hall of Fame. I mean, how can you, <laughs> yeah, how can you beat that? Um, so, no. Uh, so, my receivers that I have, uh, number one, um, I think for me, it's clear Keenan Allen. Uh, the thing with Keenan Allen that is pretty remarkable. Yes, he was riddled by injury. But if you just look at his career so far as a whole, take out the one year that he did not play for most. I think he had like one game, maybe. Um, yeah, the 2016 season where he was out. Um, the other six seasons, he's averaging over a thousand yards receiving. He had 34 touchdowns. He, he catches nearly 70% of the balls that are thrown to him. to the 68% catch percentage. And you talk about, to kind of to your point, Jake, he's not running by people. This is all with finesse. This is all with skill. This is just like the two-touch swag. This is his release that is, in my opinion, if not top, the top, top three for sure in the league. Keenan Allen just has such a great feel for the game he has such great technique and it's so awesome to see us get kj hill because he is another one of those kind of receivers that he can learn so much from keenan allen and for how much fun he is to watch and for like his the character that he is and you see where he came from cal and some of the injuries they had to deal with the acl and then some of the gnarly ones he had when he was a charger it's just so fun to see how consistent he has been and how elite he has turned his career into so Keenan Allen for sure um number two for me and this is where it kind of got hard because I think Keenan Allen personally um head and shoulders above the rest of these but so number two I have Vincent Jackson and uh, a couple stats for him almost 5,000 yards for the Chargers uh 17 yards 
per touch, which is huge. Um, but if you look at this is one of the things that kind of separate, stood out to me, 55% catch percentage. That's down mm-hmm. whatever, what is 14 points from Keenan Allen. And so that just shows you how reliable Keenan Allen was. Now, again, they're different receivers. You got a lot more jump balls, 50 yards down the field to Vincent Jackson. So I get it. But still, um, as a receiver, you want someone that's reliable. But again, Vincent Jackson, my era, number two. Um, the number three I had, uh, there were a couple of honorable mentions. Um, <laughs> I actually really liked Curtis Conway back in the day. Curtis uh, Conway. Yeah, he only played for the Chargers for three seasons, but like he was pretty good. I think he averaged like over 900 yards per season. Uh, I think he had six touchdowns for each season, but I liked him. Uh, David Boston was one of the guys where I was so excited for us to get him, and he did <laughs> basically nothing. Um, but so I, I'm going to ask you a couple. I'm going to ask you this question: If you had to, so the two guys that I'm split on for my wide receiver three, uh, Malcolm Floyd and Mike Williams. And I know Mike Williams might perk up people's ears, but if you, just asking you guys right now, who would you pick, Malcolm Floyd or Mike Williams? Floyd. Mike Williams. Okay, so that I, that, I, that didn't the end at all. So let's yeah. try this again. <laughs> no, no, but this is so this is the part that I, I don't necessarily know if people have really thought into that much, but they're very eerily similar. And so, Jake, you picked Floyd. Mm-hmm. Listen to this. So comparing the two, Malcolm Floyd, 56% catch percentage. Mike Williams, 57.5. Malcolm Floyd, yards per catch, 17.3. Mike Williams, 17.1. Yards per game, 46 yards per game for Malcolm Floyd. Mike Williams, in the two seasons that he was actually doing something, 54 yards per game. Now, if so if you expand that out, if Mike Williams keeps doing what he's doing, I think he will definitely be a better all-time player than Malcolm Floyd. But that's where my split came. Because if you kind of think about what Malcolm Floyd was, he was kind of the second fiddle to Vincent Jackson for a long time. Yeah, that's... Vincent Jackson left, uh-huh. and he kind of filled that wide receiver one role. But I don't necessarily – I honestly don't ever – I never considered him as a pure wide receiver one. Um, Mike Williams, he is currently wide receiver two. But I think if you took Keenan Allen away, I think Mike Williams has much more of a star, um, flashy highlight. He could do more than Malcolm Floyd could have done. And so when I look at those two receivers, I have them split as my wide receiver three of all time. But I think I'm leaning to Mike Williams as my wide receiver three for all Madden team because he's only three years in. And, I mean, he has not even gotten close to his full potential. So, Mike Williams, wide receiver three. Keenan Allen, Vincent Jackson, Mike Williams. All right, for me, I think I'm going to just go with these four. I chose four. Initially, I chose three. Um, so, just looking at the numbers, you know, you have to go with Lance Allworth, Charlie Joyner, and then the other two, since Rivers is the quarterback, I have to go with Keenan Allen and Vincent Jackson. So, you know, um, let's see, with with Charlie Joyner, just the level of his consistency, um, you know, he barely, he didn't really miss games. So, I mean, he, and he's put up, he's produced at a high level. Um, what was it four, four or five, 5,000, 1,000 yard seasons? I believe it's four. Um, and then, you know, he's a Hall of Famer. Uh, Lance Allworth, look at this, 23.2 yards per reception in, two, in 1965. So, you know, he, he was playing, you know, 14 years before I was born. But if you look at the numbers, like, it's just, it's crazy, right? Um, what is it? How many seasons? Is that? Look at that. Eight seasons of 1,000 yards. So, yes, over 10,000 yards career receiving yards, 18.9 yards per reception, 85 touchdowns. So, I mean, the numbers speak for himself. If you look at the film, you know, he's just a big play, smooth route runner. He's just a natural, like, receiver, right? He's just, like, it's, like, the perfect – Perfect wide receiver. You'd watch like old time football, um, just from whatever. I have I have like that fifty yard, do- uh, fifty yard, fifty, fifty year like documentary of like of history of the Chargers. So there's a lot of good like Lance Allworth film in there, um, you know. And I feel like all the the receivers that we have, like it just it's like an evolution of of like a perfect Chargers receiver. You know, Keenan Allen is one of my favorites. Um, you know, his rookie season it was the rookie of the year in two, 2013. 
Uh, the ne- you know the next three seasons he was riddled with injuries, but you know if he played full seasons, man, he would no doubt a thousand yard season. He he would be Hall of Fame like worthy right now. But you know, but you know if he produces maybe five more seasons at the level he he's at and he's more than capable of, you know, because he doesn't use his uh, physical like his his size. It's more like his technique, like Jake said, allude to, and then you know just uh just the way he runs his routes, just his his finish. Um, like, you know, just, he's conditioning himself better these days. Um, he's, he's, uh, his work ethic, his leadership, um, he's great with the fans. And then since Rivers is quarterback, you know, Vincent Jackson, and like, I, I know we brought this up before, like I was kind of disappointed that the Chargers let him go, but I think it was just like a general manager thing. Like, you know, AJ Smith didn't want to pay him, but if you look at the numbers, like he's, when he went to Tampa Bay, he put up 1000 yard season. So, you know, I thought it was worth if the numbers speak for itself, he, he would have been worth the extension. I know he's probably asking what 55 million around that time, but then, you know, the part charges want to pay him, but you know, he produced and then, you know, he produced in the playoffs as well. So, um, you know, that's what I'm going to remember. Those four are my, my top, uh, all time charges this year's all man team. And Jake, I, nice. I, don't, I don't know if you guys, I didn't realize this. Um, for for Keenan Allen, uh, I was I just went back and looked at his stats, um, and then I went down to his playoff receiving stats. Man, he's a gamer. In the only in the only two seasons that he was in the playoffs, dude went for he averaged what seven receptions and like a buck forty <laughs> uh, for a Chargers receiver who has not. I mean, <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. There's, there's and, no and secondary all, that can stop them. <laughs> well, there there was one secondary player that Keenan Allen probably could have gotten another 10 receptions per game against this team if he didn't have to go up against Chris Harris for a number of years. But now he doesn't have to worry about that anymore. So hopefully his stats can be padded a little bit more this year because of that. Um, Dan, real quick, I wanted to go back on just when you were talking about the comparisons of Mike Williams to, to Malcolm Floyd. And I, I told Dan, and if those projections, as you say, continue to go to the way love to see Mike Williams have that type of a career. The reason that I sided with Floyd um, is because I didn't really go with the recency bias aspect of it. Malcolm Floyd's bigger body of work. But here's the biggest reason. Mike Williams, first round pick out of Clemson. Clemson, which has basically become wide receiver U Mm -hmm. over the last several years. Malcolm Floyd played with the Chargers for 11 years out of being an undrafted free agent out of the University of Wyoming and to come in and do what he did. Again, the numbers weren't astronomical when you look at the greatest receivers of all time, but as far as Chargers, body of work, consistency, the one-two punch weapon that he was with Vincent Jackson. To me, he was that reliable clutch guy before Mike Williams was on this team. As far as that downfield consistent, you know, great hands type of threat, big body type guy. Um, so that was the only reason that I, that I sided with Malcolm Floyd because obviously the game was different back when he came in in 2004, but to come in as an undrafted free agent and from the school that he came from to amass that body of work, I would love to see Mike Williams not blow past what Malcolm Floyd did. But as of, as of now, as of this moment, I would have studied with Malcolm Floyd. Yeah, I mean, there, there, isn't a, there isn't a wrong answer there. It was just more, I, you, mm-hmm. you realize how close and that, how, like, similar they are in the terms of like what they produce. It's very, it, it's crazy. Yeah, it's very crazy. And I will say, and I will say so, back up just a second. I know I mentioned Keenan Allen's game or in the playoffs. The numbers I gave, those were each for two games in each of the postseasons. Um, I know there were many people that were super upset that we didn't get the ball to Keenan Allen more because you give him the ball, he's going to catch it. He's going to break tackles and he's probably going to take yards after the catch. Uh, mm-hmm. I, there's that we can talk for hours about why the Chargers have not succeeded in the playoffs. Um, Keenan Allen, not one of them. I can promise you that uh, he is part of the solution to this team on the wide receiver core, and just keep feeding that guy. <laughs> if when we get to the point yes, where we start talking about special teams, I'm sure we can find some reasonings as to why the Chargers have not gotten further in the playoffs. But that's a conversation for a different day. So, uh, so, so that's going to wrap up our 
Chargers all Madden offensive side of the ball. And so next week, we'll be getting into the defensive side of the ball. And that that will be a very interesting breakdown when you're talking about all the players. And again, if we're if we're taking this from different sides like me, who I went multi-era for all time, um, and you especially compare that to now for the Chargers defense that they have or who they've had back in the Sean Merriman days, it'll be a very interesting conversation that we'll be having next week for sure. But but we're going to close up the podcast today on that note. And uh, again, I just want to say before we close out of here that it's been fantastic coming back after two talking with Rem and, and Dan, um, you know, just football topics in general. I know that sports as a whole is we're just waiting for it to start. And it looks like August is the month, not just for football, but for other sports as well. So we're getting closer, but uh, we're trying to fill up this time with some interesting content for you guys. And we appreciate everybody that's been sticking with us through this time. So we do very much appreciate it. And again, um, please follow us on Twitter at the Chargers Brawl handle myself at JT Hefner, Rem at all. R-E-M underscore I-X and Dan Wolkenstein at Chargers Homer. So until next week, we appreciate you all. Um, hope you guys are all staying safe as we get back to some level of normalcy, not just in sports, but in life. And, uh, and we will see you next week on the Chargers Brawl podcast.